Uh, so welcome uh, to the Department of Chemistry. Uh, just a second. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the Department of Chemistry. Uh, hope uh, you're all uh, doing well and uh, staying safe. And thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Uh, my name is Swamik Siddhanta, and I'm the webinar uh, facilitator and an assistant professor uh, at the Department of Chemistry, IIT Delhi. And we are very pleased to bring you this content today, uh, which is the part of the online Pratidvani series uh, that the department is organizing. Uh, the webinar series is sponsored by Author Cafe. Uh, Author Cafe is an online platform that aids with writing, collecting, organizing, collaborating, and publishing your research content through features and integrations with products like Mendeley, Zotero, Orchid, Crossref, and so on. So you can think it like Google Docs, specially designed and developed for the academic community and much more. So today uh, we are thrilled to have uh, Professor Dipanjan Pan uh, from uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore and the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, USA. Uh, so Professor Dipanjan Pan is an expert in uh, nanomedicine, molecular imaging and drug delivery. Uh, Professor Pan's lab, uniquely merges fundamental chemistry, biology, and engineering to bring solution to today's healthcare problems. Uh, his research is highly collaborative and interdisciplinary, centering on the development of novel materials for biomedical applications, immune nanomedicine, and targeted therapies for stem-like uh, stem cancer cells with phenotypically screened nanomedicine platforms. Uh, over the years, his research has resulted in more than 100 high impact peer reviewed publications in scientific journals, numerous conference abstracts, and has been supported by numerous external funding agencies such as NIH, NSF, DOD, uh, etc. Uh, he holds uh, multiple patents and is the founder of three university based early startups. Uh, he is the CEO or president of uh, the biotechnology startup Vitruvian uh, Biotech, dedicated to develop novel method, uh, novel image guided therapies. Uh, he also co founded Insight Technologies, dedicated to nanotechnology based application for ocular diseases. His other company, Calocyte, uh, which he co founded with his clinical co collaborators, develops artificial oxygen carrier. Uh, his technology has been licensed for commercial development multiple times. He also serves as study section review board member for NIH and other agencies such as NSF and multiple review committee member for uh, American Heart Association. In 2016, he received Nanomaterial uh, Letter Research Award. In 2017, uh, Young Innovator Award from Biomedical Engineering Society and uh, also the Dean's Award for Research Excellence in 2018. He is an elected fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, a fellow of American Heart Association, and an elected fellow of American College of Cardiology. Uh, Professor Pan is an, uh, also an editorial board member of Scientific Reports and an editorial advisor member of Molecular Ph Pharmaceutics, uh, which is a journal which is published from uh, ACS. And uh, uh, so a very warm welcome to Professor Pan and uh, over to you, Professor Pan. Thank you, Shomik. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to um, be here and uh, um, talk about um, our research. Um, Shomik and I, I just I briefly wanted to mention that uh, he and I interacted uh, briefly when he was here and um, um, he was organizing uh, a conference, um, I think a symposium, small symposium for SciEx analytical um, um, chemistry uh, conference. And uh, they invited me for um, an, an, an a talk. And uh, so we briefly interacted there. So, um, and I'm, I'm so happy to see that he's well settled back in, in India. Um, so, again, um, thank you for uh, inviting me to give a talk. Um, it's, uh, you know, um, I, I was, I was thinking, uh, uh, what kind of topics would be, um, um, you know, uh, would be timely. Um, and, uh, you know, immediately, um, our COVID-19 sensing work, um, came to my mind. It's so, um, uh, it's happening now. And, um, I think it's, uh, you know, everyone is kind of connected to it. So, when I decided to give a talk on 
uh, the point of care biosensing um, strategies that we are using for um, you know, COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, as Shomik mentioned, that um, I'm, I'm a professor in um, engineering and medicine for um, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Baltimore County. Um, I recently moved from University of Illinois, Arbonne Champaign, uh, where I was an associate professor and associate head for Department of Bioengineering. Um, this is my disclosure and I is grants founders of 4 startups and licensing of technologies and no uh, clinical off level uses for any of the. Um, any of the drugs that we were uh, going to talk about uh, briefly about my uh, lab. Um, um, at Illinois and now at uh, Maryland, these are my academic labs. I have 2 labs uh, 1 in the engineering building. We have a, a full capability of doing. Um, wet chemistry in vitro, um, ex vivo small animal studies. Um, um, so we're, we're fully equipped to do um, um, starting from drug synthesis or nanoparticle synthesis to characterization and uh, their um, um, biological characterization and physical chemical characterization. Our second lab is located in the downtown Baltimore um, uh, next to Inner Harbor um, in the Medicine School of Medicine campus where we, we have um, 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 small and large animal studies going on. We also have a small setup for doing nanosynthesis and uh, nanoparticle fabrication and characterization and other things. Um, so these are my academic labs, but um, um, interestingly, uh, both the labs have a, um, a seamless synergy um, between the two labs, the students can access all these facilities in, um, in, in each of these um, 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 individual lab spaces and uh, um, they have access to um, 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 all, all, all good facilities in, in both these locations. Um, startups and that those are, those are key um, aspect of our research. We are very translational. We want to see things happening um, in, you know, and commercialize. Um, so that um, we can we can develop technologies um, in the academic lab and we can quickly translate them uh, for human use. Um, uh, for startups inside RNA disease diagnostics, uh, Kelocyte and Vitruvian Bio, and they are kind of all over the place. Um, uh, one of the company inside is still back in Illinois. Um, Kelocyte that moved with me um, that is located in downtown uh, Baltimore. Um, RNA disease diagnostics that is in uh, New York and Vitruvian bio is also in um, Baltimore. What we do, we we take a very multidisciplinary approach to solve a fundamental and translational biomedical uh, problems of in uh, imaging, sensing, and therapy. Um, we uniquely merge molecule making and device making. Uh, I'm trained as a chemist, and uh, I bring that expertise. Uh, but then I have done, uh, you know, over the years of almost 20 years, I have done um, uh, translational research. So that way um, I bring a lot of um, um, expertise in engineering. So we combine basic science in, from uh, chemistry and biology and then combine it with engineering to solve um, um, uh, biomedical problems. Uh, we're also, we, we have started using um, a machine learning and artificial intelligence based tools and um, you know, applying them for these applications. Um, so, uh, for there are three pillars for our research. Uh, one is point of care biosensing. We are heavily interested in. Um, uh, we're kind of one of the labs that are, that are leading labs in the U.S. that uh, um, are um, experts in infectious disease diagnostics, um, uh, bacterial, viral, and fungi. Uh, we're also interested in doing. Um, a traumatic brain injury type um, um, sensing um, covering eye and ocular injury and uh, brain injury. Um, and then um, on the therapy side, we have been working on for a long time. Um, um, we were NCI funded. Um, um, we the, the most successful project would be the nanoscale biosynthetic red cell substitute for on demand oxygen delivery. And that's the basis of the company Kelocyte. Um, but there are um, other other areas where uh, we are also focusing on, for example, gene editing CRISPR therapies for um, breast cancer. And also we recently shown that um, a fluid form nanotherapy 
um, is possible where nanoparticles will be generated inside um, the cancer cells. Um, in, and and um, last but not the least is imaging and, and, and imaging probes. And this is something where um, I um, uh, have been working on for many, many, many years. And uh, we, we are interested in developing um, uh, imaging probes for um, uh, for biological targets and for multi-scale imaging. Um, and the multi-scale imaging means we can go from organ to to tissue to cell, and uh, even at a single molecule level. Um, and we apply wide varieties of um, um, uh, imaging um, um, modalities. Uh, for example, uh, hyperspectral imaging, photoacoustic imaging, or um, uh, photon counting CT imaging. Uh, we are looking at um, uh, near infrared to optical imaging. And we apply this for wide ranges of uh, biological um, applications. So atherosclerosis, angiogenesis, uh, cancer stem cells, immunotherapy, um, and these kind of things we, um, we kind of um, cover. So this is in a nutshell what my lab kind of does, uh, three pillars, uh, biosensing therapy and uh, um, imaging. Um, again, uh, the basis is really chemistry, um, material science, um, and uh, we want to make novel materials, uh, but uh, uh, keeping in very engineering philosophy, but um, um, our focus is really to solve uh, biomedical problems. Uh, but for today's talk, I think we were, we were going to focus only on the genosensing approaches for infectious disease, and that is uh, uh, the COVID-19 diagnostics. Um, so, as we all know, that COVID-19 is a global pandemic. Uh, the first case reported in China in December 2019, and uh, in March to 2020, uh, who WHO uh, recognized the outbreak as a pandemic. Um, since then, um, there has been uh, 219 million worldwide confirmed cases. This is, um, I think, um, I think uh, a two weeks old uh, data, so um, could be even more. Um, and um, and that's from January 2020. And uh, um, the the total uh, number of cases in the U.S. alone is 44 million. Um, total number of death is uh, nearly 5 million and uh, almost a million or 700,000 deaths in the US. And um, so WHO has appealed for global mass testing with uh, a demand estimated to be more than 600 million tests. Um, that includes uh, genetic tests and, uh, and rapid tests um, so that we can screen um, uh, individuals um, uh, on a regular basis, and um, and as a result of that, um, this pandemic can be controlled. And it's just not the vaccine, it's just not uh, um, the mask, but it's uh, the regular testing which is going to help us uh, to come out of this um, this uh, pandemic. So if we think about uh, the genetic makeup of the SARS-CoV-2, um, you will see that it, it's a it's a really it's a it's a tiny um, genome, uh, only twenty thousand uh, base pairs, and it has the nucleotide has um, high similarity to a bat COVID nineteen virus, and we um, you must be reading all about you know the origin of COVID nineteen, and there is a debate whether it's a lab lab the origin is the lab or origin is. Uh, you know, uh, the, the flea market and, uh, you know, meat market. Um, and, uh, but there is no doubt about it that the, the, the source was bat and bat cove is a 96% of nucleotide identity. Uh, pangolin that also has a 91% of uh, similarity. If we compare it with a common cold flu virus, you will see only 50% of um, uh, similarity. So it's not that much. Uh, with SARS-CoV, that uh, the SARS virus that uh, um, that kind of gave us a little bit of threat a um, um, few years back, only 80% of um, um, uh, genetic uh, makeup. Um, SARS-CoV-2, the problem with that is that there is a spike protein and on the surface, 
and uh, it is optimized for binding to the human-like um, SEE2, and that's a result of a natural selection. Now, if this spike protein that um, undergoes kind of a mutation, then um, that will allow the virus to escape, partially escape from the vaccine or even existing any kind of hard immunity. And that makes it very difficult to develop um, vaccines for these um, uh, for this uh, virus or even um, uh, um, diagnostic tests. Now, if we talk about the tests, then where really we need to target, right? So this is, um, um, this is a plot where it, it's showing that SARS-CoV-2 viral load or antibody load and uh, um, in the y-axis, in the x-axis, it's showing that the time since the symptom onset. So if we look at it, then patients typically develop symptoms within five to six days of the incubation period. And as a result of that, um, there is the viral load, and you can see here that the viral load is, um, it picks in the first week um, of the infection and decline gradually after that. And, and well, if you consider an antibody as your target or your point of care test, then the antibody response is really uh, gradually increases from the first week and is, is often detectable somewhere around the day 14. So until we hit kind of uh, the second week uh, post-infection, um, our chance of detecting um, the virus uh, is, is it's almost none. So the two things we're looking at, and one is a direct uh, the virus, detecting the virus. The second is the detecting the effect of the virus on the body. And as a result, because the virus is a foreign entity, the body will generate antibody and, and that uh, can be detected, but that detection, antibody detection is too late. It's uh, two weeks from the date of, um, um, you know, from the day of the infection. And so the virus that kind of leads to diverse range of uh, clinical issues, um, you know, and it could be mild infection, it could be a very strong infection with high heavy viral load, um, and sometimes based on the person's immune, um, you know, system, uh, how, how the person's body is reacting to it, the person could even remain completely asymptomatic or the person could have a severe symptoms and that could range from, um, you know, um, mild fever to high fever to even high mortality rate. And we know that that that's been um, that's been the case for um, um, for for this uh, for this virus. So the bottom line here is that the take home message from this slide is that um, antibody testing is really too late, and that that point we were the patients is already uh, starting to feel um, um, the strong symptoms um, um, and, and moderate to severe illness, and then critical illness can it can lead to so and hospitalization, ICU admission, and all kinds of shortness of breath and oxygen requirement. So what we really need is that targeting the virus at a molecular level would allow us to even detect it at this level, where the virus has just been, <clears throat> you know, in, or the patient has just been infected. We can even, we can even theoretically think about uh, detecting the virus in, um, you know, the next day of the infection by doing a molecular testing, where in the molecular testing, we will target uh, the viral genome or a genetic material of the virus. But it needs to be rapid and simple, and I'll explain why. Uh, and of course, high accuracy, because we cannot really give false positive because that leads to a lot of other complications because the patient or the person who is getting the false positive results, they will be excluded from um, from many activities, going to school or colleges, offices, uh, traveling and all kinds of stuff. So false positive is not good. False negative is also not good because, you know, the person is, if, if the, we get a false negative result, then the person is roaming around and spreading the disease. And then that is absolutely not a good thing. So if we think about the viral dynamics and load in COVID-19 patients, 
Um, so this is a, a study that has been not done by our, my lab, but um, by some other group and published in Journal of Clinical Virology last year. And that shows that the fraction of cases in um, Y axis and in X axis, we are looking at log 10 viral load. That is a genome copies per male. So this is the target population that we were looking at where our the genome copies is really we were looking at a 3.5 ish to 8.5 and that is somewhere in the high viral load. The second target population is where the viral load is really, really low. And that is somewhere around the log 10 viral load or the genome copies per male would be one to three. So these are the two, two direct population that we were looking at. Now here it says three distinct populations. So be, why is that? Because one population completely remains asymptomatic. So we wanted to say that that is also another category. But if we're really constantly checking the virus, then uh, we, we should be able to detect uh, the presence of the virus in those um, asymptomatic patients. So the population one is uh, the viral load four to 10, where CT, as you might have uh, might know, that um, that's, a, that's a number that comes from RT-PCR. So that's a cycle, but how many cycles that RT-PCR is really um, going after, um, you know, are, are required to see the presence of the, the virus. Population two, that's, uh, that's even less than four, for um, the genome copies, and that means there the CT number is 40. That means you need to have the maximum cycles to, to be able to see the virus. Population three is basically the asymptomatic patients where um, you know, the viral load could be anything from four to 14, so we, we really don't really know. But we know for sure is key is the early detection. If we can detect a person before the manifestation of the symptoms, then that's the key from um, applying, and that's the key from um, uh, from protecting um, all all the people around us and the person who is infected as well. So now, what is out there? So this is a slide that kind of compares the tests. Um, so there are three types of tests right now: molecular test and antigen test, and these are really detecting the virus by itself. And there is serological tests, that means blood tests that are known to detect the antibodies. So those are indirect tests that are detecting the, the effect of the, uh, the virus uh, to the body. That means body is also responding to the presence of the virus. And as a result of that, there will be some um, antibodies that are, that are generating and, and that will be found in blood, uh, which can be detected. But again, this is something where, as we indicated before, that this is a past infection. We are not really, we're not really interested in that because this is good for immunity check. If the person is really developing a strong immunity, that is good. But we are interested in early detection. And for doing early detection, our best bet is doing molecular and antigen test. That means either you go after the proteins that are present in the virus, or we are going after the genetic material that is present in the virus, okay? So um, now if we compare the molecular and antigen test, we will see that most of the times the antigen tests are absolutely fantastic in terms of giving a result uh, quickly. So it is very fast, rapid results can be obtained. There is no sample, complex sample preparation. But the problem with antigen test is that it is easily impacted by mutations, less sensitive, and uh, you know anything where CT is greater than 35 is challenging. That means if we are if, if a person is having very low viral load, then antigen test is most likely not going to capture um, those um, um, the, the presence of virus in there. Um, in the molecular test, however, that this is highly sensitive assay specific, um, resistant to mutation, it is not quite clear depending on the type of the test we're talking about. There are many tests that are out there that are not really resistant to mutation, but there is always a possibility to develop tests that are, that can be, um, that can be 
absolutely robust and um, that will take care of any mutations. Sample preparation is also very complex. Oftentimes you need an RNA isolation. Uh, oftentimes you need an amplification step. That means uh, increasing temperature is a, is a is a very um, is a necessity for uh, for this kind of detection technology. And if we're talking about RT PCR, then the result would take um, literally uh, from four hours to two days, and we have all experienced that in in our life, right? So the bottom line here is that the tests need to be uh, um, simple, rapid. Um, readout needs to be simple, minimal sample preparation. We we need to do it at home or um, in a in a in a setting where um, you know there is there is no labs, uh, no expert, um, uh, no ex expensive analytical instrument, um, and it has to be um, inexpensive. It cannot be um, 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 costly. The detection sensitivity and this is these are all set by CDC and FDA requirement, detection sensitivity must be um, less than 100 copies per microliter. And uh, it ideally, it should not be affected by any emerging variants or other similar pathogens. If we are saying that our test works great for SARS-CoV-2, but also works great for Mars virus, then we have a problem. So with that in mind, um, um, we developed some tests and uh, we're gonna talk about that. So before we do that, Let's understand our enemy. So enemy is really the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that is causative of uh, COVID-19 um, 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 COVID disease. So this is a cross section of the virus. It shows that um, there are four proteins that are we're interested in. The, the most important is the spike trimer that is on the surface. And um, that actually has a strong affinity to ACE2 receptor on the, um, on the on the on the on the human the host cell, and that is primed by another protein which is TMPRSS2. There are other proteins that are important, and that is enveloped protein, and also um, uh, some membrane proteins are there. But we decided to go after the nucleoprotein or nucleocapsids, and because that is inside the virus, and uh, it is less prone to undergo mutations. Um, so it is, and it's well known, you know, over over two years, there's the significant amount of study has been done, and that has confirmed that nucleoprotein or N gene is really uh, the most conserved, um, um, the uh, most conserved um, uh, genetic um, um, uh, target for SARS-CoV-2. So with that goal, our target was the N gene of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, the question is, how can we make sure that there is no impact from SARS-CoV-2 mutations? So we meticulously, we looked at the impact of from variants and mutations. And these are on the left side, you can see that these are the SARS-CoV-2 variants. And, and these are all currently known variants, including the Delta variant. And also um, these are engine mutations associated with the variant and, and on the, right inside you are looking at the affected engine sites so for example you can see that these are all from 609 to 614 um, and then 702 to 704 and i think some of them are from 1131 to 1133 so these are the regions that are undergoing uh, the mutation so based on that what we have really done is that we have selected a target sequence um, an antisense oligos and um, our starting target position was 421, and that is far apart from where the, um, the N gene undergoes mutation. And the ending target position was 440. So uniquely targets region where um, the, the unaffect, which is unaffected by the N gene mutation. The assay is really designed to is mostly conserve N gene site. The mutations in other regions of the genome have almost no impact on the performance of the assay because we are not targeting S protein or um, enveloped protein or membrane proteins. The reliability and reproducibility, even theoretically, we can absolutely say that um, that this is this is not going to be impacted by any known um, um, known mutations. 
So this is the design principle of the antisense oligonucleotides for targeting engine. And this part of the work was done by um, um, a super duper uh, a rock star um, um, junior faculty in my lab, um, Dr. Parikit Moitra. Um, and he's uh, as a research associate and a junior faculty at um, University of Maryland, Baltimore and in my lab. So what he did, um, he designed uh, uh, four ASOs and um, these ASOs, uh, the, the, the reason we, we wanted to design four ASOs is because it's a claw-like um, um, uh, design. So two of them, one and two, they're binding the front location of the, the gene or the end protein. And um, the two of them are binding the end location. As a result of that, this, this kind of claw-like, um, it's like a collation. And um, uh, that, that, that the, the way these are binding to both the front location and the end location, this allows for an extremely strong um, um, and stable binding for, uh, um, uh, from these um, ASOs. So what we have done is that we have applied, and th there is a movie, and I'm hoping that this movie will work. Yes, it works, and it shows that how the ASOs are undergoing, this is an MD simulation uh, for 100, and, uh, 100 nanosecond that kind of shows that how the MD simulation that allows the virus, I'm sorry, the antisense oligo, one of the oligos is this ASO1 that is undergoing um, the structural changes, and it, you will see that it forms a loop structure at 102 nanoseconds, it forms a loop kind of structure, U-like U structure. And, uh, and, and this is important because we will come back to that in a, in a second. But we have applied three modalities. The first one is a plasmonic or visual technique um, where we're applying Bohr nanoparticles. And we are, we are relying on the fact that Bohr is a plasmon. And with the change in the plasmon, um, with when the gold particles are conjugated with the antisense oligos, and when it comes in contact with the RNA, then there will be an aggregation or agglomeration. And as a result of that, um, the, the plasmonic, there will be a plasmonic shift, and that will change the color. And you can see that the COVID-19 positive RNA uh, changed color from red or purplish um, in, in COVID-19 negative RNA or even the non-specific Mars COVID-19 RNA to blue when there is a positive RNA. So this is a visual assay and we published this work in ACS Nano and this is probably the first, um, 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 first um, you know, engine targeted, um, 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 engine targeted diagnostic test that, that got published and uh, uh, last year. And then we um, we followed up with another paper in Nature Protocol um, uh, earlier this year. But we were not happy because our limit of detection was only 10 copies per microliter. And we wanted to see if we really can go even below. We, can, we wanted to get to a single virus detection level. Then what we did is we, we wanted to get to an electrochemical. So something like a, a glucose test um, that uh, diabetic patients they use at home. Um, here again, we are applying a, you know, again, it's all material science. We, we applied a 2D and 3D uh, materials, um, sorry, 2D and 3D material, a combination of hybrid 2D and 3D material to prepare um, an electrode. And based on that, what we found that we can even get to a limit of detection of six copies per microliter and with no amplification needed. Where the plasmonic or visual test required the sample to assay time of 30 minutes, this electrochemical test was only two to three minutes to, uh, to develop. So this work was also published um, in SES Nano um, in 2020. And um, this, um, both of these works were licensed by uh, the company RNA Disease Diagnostics for development. So we are hoping that, um, and the, the device that you are looking at here is an actual device. And this is the strip you're looking at. And we're hoping that in six months, this product will be in market. But again, like I said, that we were still not happy because we think that we can even push the boundary and we can even push the limit of detection even below. So what we did then, we tried to apply dark field microscopy and that's, that's called hyperspectral uh, imaging. 
So there, we applied something uh, called hafnium nanoparticle. So hafnium, um, and this is again serendipitous discovery that hafnium provided a much better scattering than than gold particles. And as a result of that, what we did is we came up with a, a microarray, and this is kind of a microarray, and uh, and we detected this virus. Um, at a level of yucto molar, which is uh, almost like a less than a virus molecule we can detect. This is all real time happening. Um, the sensitivity is RT-PCR level. Um, absolutely possible to do multiplexing. That means you can do, uh, you can combine um, um, SARS-CoV-2 and, um, and uh, influenza virus all together and uh, detect it by this way. So this is, I think, a very exciting technology that we were we we're really looking at. So um, ten copies per microliter we're looking at, and then we went to a less than a less than a virus. So sample to asset time is also very hyperplasmonic, and hyperspectral also is um, is very less time. Uh, it's almost real time. So with that, I think I'm going to go uh, talk a little bit about the details of these technologies that we were we're developing this. Uh, Antisense oligonucleotides that um, is again, this is a platform technology and we have published in series of papers since last year to um, to show that this is this is real. This really works um, so with very high sensitivity and specificity and a positive predictive value is 98% with a negative predictive value of 97%. And as you can see here that we have tested um, about 134 positive samples and 124 negative clinical samples. And, uh, and then after that, we have obtained the accuracy and specificity and sensitivity for, uh, for these, um, uh, for these um, uh, with these uh, um, oligonucleotides. So this is the approach one where the plasmonic nanoparticle best, you can see that um, this is the gold ASO capped gold nanoparticles. They're absolutely um, looking fantastic. There is no agglomeration, uh, but in presence of SARS-CoV-2 engine, there is a red shift um, of about 40 nanometer. And as a result of that, the clustered gold nanoparticles are, um, are seen on TEM. And, um, and this is happening because of the, the, the presence of the RNA. And as a result of that, there is a, there is a precipitation. Um, you can see this is uh, clearly visible. Neg these are negative COVID-19 clinical sample. This is positive, um, uh, clearly visible. Um, you can see that how we're comparing that with the RT-PCR CT numbers. These all these clinical um, samples. These are nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swabs, and you can see that um, most of these are um, a little bit on the higher side of the um, of the CT number. That is. Uh, uh, 20 cycles and we'll get the we'll, we'll know the virus load. So that means there's a not really a low virus uh, or low um, uh, the samples were not with low virus viral load. Um, and we also did something with the saliva and we spiked the saliva with uh, the RNA collected from the human patients and uh, it it works and the biological matrix did not really um, uh, make any. Um, any impact to our test. And uh, you can see that the, this is the negative COVID-19 cases, and this is the threshold line, and there's a positive COVID-19 cases, and uh, you can clearly detect only one, I think we're kind of in the borderline. And, uh, you know, the cross-reactivity, you see there is no cross-reactivity with uh, other similar viruses like MERS-CoV-2 and others. Um, we also developed a test that uh, that uh, we uh, that we can directly um, um, test it from clinical samples without the requirement of an RNA extraction or purification. And in this case, we were applying uh, a lysis buffer um, that is capable of uh, destroying the viral capsid layer and take the RNA out from uh, from from the from the sample. And uh, we. Uh, in in series of tests, we have confirmed that our recipe uh, recipe works. In approach two, what we did is the electrochemical sensing, as we were talking about. So this is where uh, um, we we developed a, a graphene based sensor. Um, so we have a, a graphene platelet, which is uh, around uh, two nanometer in 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 in, in diameter, and uh, 
uh, and we have uh, the gold particles that are conjugated to um, um, the antisense oligos that are immobilized on top of the graphene sensors. And so this 2D and 3D um, um, you know, structure that kind of gives uh, um, you know, a beautiful um, uh, uh, kind of an e e electrochemical platform. Because what happens is that I, I want to go back to that um, simulation that we talked about where the antisense oligos kind of form um, a U structure or a loop structure. So the antisense oligos are really pointing towards the surface um, of the electrode. So now the moment the viral RNA comes in and it binds to the antisense oligos, this, um, the loop structure is, is now more um, you know, kind of lifted upwards. And as a result of that, there is an upward pool of electrons. And that is detected by um, the change in the impedance or uh, the resistance or even the cyclic voltmetry. And then that is, um, that is, that is really um, what we were relying on um, uh, to get a quantitative result. Um, so here, again, it works like a glucose meter. Um, the, the, is, um, no amplification is required. And um, the idea is to get some disposable sensors, um, a razor blade model where you have, you know, the patient will be testing it and then uh, once the test is done, the, the strip can be thro thrown away. But the, the meter, the device is going to stay with the patient and, um, and it can be tested again uh, the following day with a new strip. This is something where we're looking at a photograph of the graphene sensor platform uh, of ACM uh, images of the gra graphene platform uh, in presence of the SARS-CoV-2 um, RNA and in absence of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And this is uh, A is really um, um, an optical picture of uh, um, the sensor, um, um, the contour-based uh, microelectrode that we have developed. And this part of the work was done by um, 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 Maha Lafif, who is a PhD student, uh, finally a PhD student from Illinois Bioengineering, and Ketan Dike, who is also a bioengineer in my laboratories. Um, so, um, and so this is the response that we're looking at, that is the change in the voltage after that addition of the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and you can see that this is uh, uh, the delta V over V naught um, over RNA concentration. Uh, there's, there's a linear curve. Um, so there's a linear relationship with uh, the change in the concentration. And um, you can see that how the cross reactivity is not an issue even for these, um, um, for these electrochemical sensors. So we, we tested it in, in many patient samples and uh, um, with satisfactory result, you can see that this is a positive COVID-19 samples with blue curve, and this is a negative uh, sample that shows there's no change in the voltage. Um, again, these are all clinical data that shows uh, the accuracy is 100%, sensitivity is 100% with a specificity of 100%. So we were extremely happy with, uh, and the number of samples that we have tested was 59 positive and uh, 30 negative samples. Now, with that, I, I would like to talk about this approach and the hyperspectral best. Um, um, so this is a molecular level quantification of viral load, um, but this is challenging and time consuming and level intensive. So what can we do to really do uh, to make this happen? So what we propose, and this is the first time someone really proposing hyperspectral technique as a, a method for biosensing. Um, and we published the work in ACS Nano um, earlier this year, um, where we are showing that these uh, unique uh, microarrays can be developed and we can rely on the spectral angular mapping or SAM um, and look at the peak shift that, that is happening uh, in presence of the RNA. And, the, and a semi quantification can be can be made. So, what is I think we you know you know in 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 a five minutes or so I would like to talk about what is hyperspectral imaging. So, hyperspectral imaging is something that is like a human um, eye, but it's uh, it is equipped with uh, an advanced technique. So, so th there is. This is on the left hand side. You're looking at an RGB image, which is only red, green, and blue, but in hyperspectral imaging, we use something called a hypercube. So, a hypercube is really a 3D data set of a 2D image. 
on each wavelength. So a hyperspectral imager will spread the light from every pixel of um, a particular image into a continuous spectrum. And as a result of that, that will provide us detailed information to accurately identify or classify objects that are present in the scene. So very useful and very powerful. So what we're showing here is that, um, that a microarray can be developed. And in this case, half the nanoparticles um, will be conjugated um, with the antisense oligos that we have developed. And uh, then when the target viral RNA is comes in, then the same concept that half the nanoparticles will aggregate. And this will also happen for gold nanoparticles. But serendipitously, we found out that hafnium nanoparticles exhibited um, higher light scattering compared to the gold nanoparticles. Why is that? It's not quite clear. And we really need to understand by doing some fundamental studies that why the light scattering is coming more for gold nano, uh, for hafnium nanoparticles than gold nanoparticles. But ideally, gold nanoparticles can also be used for hyperspectral imaging and, um, and, and that can be applied. So what we're doing here is that this is the this is the characterization. You can see that these are the hafnium particles. You can see that these are tiny hafnium particles. These are uh, two to two to five nanometer size. And in presence of SARS-CoV-2, you can see these large aggregates that are present. And you can see that in hyperspectral images, you can clearly see the large aggregates that are present. So we, may, we developed some computational algorithms. So hyperspectral images will give you these kind of images. Then we create a spectral library and the spectral angular mapping, uh, or we call it um, a SAM, and uh, where we extract the, the region of interest with spectral information where hafnium ASO nanoparticle, and after the conjugation or after the agglomeration with the um, uh, with RNA, there will be a shift in the in the in the in the peak, and 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 as and that shift is really we were calculating for quantifying the viral load. So here you can see the shift. Um, so one is really the negative, there is nothing, and then uh, two is really the positive, where you can see that um, something from 532 or something. And that is a shifting towards um, 630. So almost like a hundred nanometer of shift um, that is causing because of the presence of the RNA. So this is again the same thing. You see 553 and 632. That's the that's the type of the shift that we're looking at when there is um, um, an uh, COVID-19 RNA present. When we tested the performance of this hyperspectral assay using um, uh, different kinds of um, um, using um, 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 uh, clinical samples and 48 positive samples and 18 negative samples. And you can see that how these are working. There's a, no uh, misidentification happened here. Then we tested the direct samples in the, where no RNA extraction was required. And again, we applied the, that uh, lysis buffer and, and it worked really well. And in, as a matter of fact, we direct sampling, we tested 65 positive sample and 34 negative samples and with no um, misidentification of any, any of these. Um, we also tested the adaptability of the hyperspectral assay with uh, influenza H1N1 virus. And as you can see here that this is the H1N1, there is uh, almost no signal, um, whereas, um, uh, no, this is the hafnium uh, just particle, but in presence of H1N1 virus, there is, um, there is a strong signal coming out because these hafnium particles are now uh, carrying an antisense oligos that is highly specific for the influenza. So that means we can do multiplexing with uh, this kind of approach. So with that, I'm just going to end here, and I'm just going to say that uh, we didn't talk about therapy or imaging, uh, but um, we talked about the translatable solution that is possible for COVID-19 early detection. Uh, is proposed and uh, RNA disease diagnostic, a company um, uh, licensed this technologies and uh, this is um, something that is coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, and um, and uh, we're hoping that the product will be in market and uh, this, is, uh, this is clearly an example of uh, uh, a bench to bedside um, type research. 
Um, and FDA approval also process is in process. EUA is in process, but my lab is uh, FDA certified to do uh, to accept samples and to do um, um, laboratory diagnostic tests. Um, with that acknowledgement, it's uh, uh, it's not possible to do this research without funding from um, different agencies. For example, NIH, NIBIB. Um, um, American Heart, um, City MRP, and other organizations, uh, all my startups, um, um, great collaborators around the country and outside, and um, of course, my absolutely dedicated um, uh, team of, um, 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 you know, of, um, junior faculty, postdocs, and uh, graduate students, undergraduates, and even high school students, and they're, they're really awesome. Um, and, uh, Again, thank you so much. Um, I um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm here and uh, giving this talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Khan, for the uh, insightful and uh, stimulating talk, and uh, we got to learn so many things about uh, detecting uh, you know, this COVID uh, coronaviruses. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, so here. Uh, there are faculty members and students and also uh, people uh, watching this live on YouTube. So I request uh, everyone to, uh, you can raise your hand and, uh, uh, or you can just uh, request, uh, or if you raise your hand, I can just unmute you. Pro real time PCR. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, the floor is now open to questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, as we wait for the question, so I have a couple of questions. So if I can. Sure. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, actually, it was interesting to uh, see uh, uh, both, you know, optical as well as electrochemical based sensors. Uh, so in case of your uh, like electrochemical sensor, you said that uh, you use two D graphene as and uh, together with a 3d uh, kind of sensor uh, like electrode uh, so uh, so did you kind of like uh, so how did you integrate that with the paper like the graphene so is it like made in situ or like uh, like yes. in terms of like commercialization how would you make it like very fast process for example those kind yeah. of strips so yeah, so the I, I yeah, so graphene is immobilized on the filter paper, and that's a, that's okay. a known technique in my lab, and we've been doing that for some time, um, mm -hmm. and um, we, you know, we, again for for the gold deposition, and that's uh, that is done. You can do that for multiple different ways, you know, EBM evaporation and other things, you know, um, in the clean room you can do it or. Or some other other means you can do. Even even the spin coating can uh, can also also be applied. For um, and and for the gold particles, this is something that is uh, kind of placed on the you know like drop deposited on the on on the graphene and the and the electrodes. The reason that we were interested in 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 applying the graphene is that it's a, so nice um, conductive material and it really works well. Uh, we we tested with and without graphene, and I think uh, um, the the result is much more um, um, you know result is much way better than without having a graphene in the in the in the in the sensor system. Okay, okay. Uh, so we see a, I see a hand up here, uh, Jolly Xavier. Yeah, you, if you can uh, please ask your question. Uh Hi, good evening, and um, it was a wonderful talk. So I would like to just ask. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, well, one question as uh, two questions rather. So one is on the specificity of this um, SARS virus, say, for example. So if we have got a mixture of with something else, so how do we make sure that this is the particular one is being detected? Uh, especially when we are using plasmonic particle based sensing. So, uh, is it the functionalization is uh, very specific to this particular virus or how it is being done? Yeah, so the 
the engine targeted antisense oligos that we developed it's um it's a highly specific for um the engine for the sars cov2 only and not engine for any other viruses and we have tested it for and uh, all the papers also that we, we talked about that um, talks about the cross reactivity and non-specific binding uh, to any other viruses like mars or sars cov1 um, zika and um, yellow virus so we have tested the um, any um, non-specific binding to those those things so non-specificity is uh, not really a problem and it is across the um the the detail the um the techniques that we have developed because all the techniques are based on um this unique antisense oligos that we have developed so our sensitivity and our sensitivity comes from the detection technique but our specificity comes from the antisense oligos the molecule that we have developed for um, targeting um, the engine of the virus. Oh, great. So one more, uh, just if it is okay, sure. I'll just go for one sure, more question. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That is on again on plasma any particles. So uh, the, how do we make sure that? So when we do we go to a single molecule of virus, and how do you estimate that it's a single molecular level of detection actually? So do you have a statistical analysis afterwards or? Yeah, so with yeah. plasmonic, we cannot really go to single molecule, unfortunately. Okay. So, like I said, I think um, um, so. Our goal was to really push the boundary from going from uh, you know uh, ten copies per microliter to uh, a single um, single copy um, with plasmonic because it's a visual. We cannot really um, get to that kind of sensitivity level. But we can definitely do that with um, hyperspectral. Um, it's a dark, it's a microscopy-based technique, and it has a more, it's more powerful. And um, so, um, and it's likely that uh, the hyperspectral-based technique is not going to be a point of care um, type, um, um, you know, detection. Um, so we and and by 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 doing a, a, you know, a lot of um, a computational algorithm and statistical analysis, we have shown that we can, we can get to um, a single virus level um, uh, detection capability for, um, for, uh, with, the, with the hyperspectral, uh, but not with plasmonic. We cannot really get to that level with plasmonic. Why do you think that? What is the limiting factor over there? Is the hotspot cannot be like very specific for single molecular level or detection? Well, it's visual, right? So it has, a, you know, if you're if you're trying to, you're you're really relying on, um, you know, the color change. So your visual, you have a limitation. So if you're if you're if you apply some, um, uh, you know, like an like a spectrophotometer, you might be able to push the boundary a little bit more down. But um, with a visual color change, you know, if you, if someone is trying to see, oh, okay, uh, even with in presence of one single virus in um, in a in a in a less than a microliter of sample, or you know, like a 0.5 mil of sample, um, and with one single virus, it will change color. It's impossible to do that. You know, and even if you're using um, a dye based thing or a gold particle based thing, it's uh, almost impossible to do that because of uh, the constraint of, uh, you know, I mean, visual, right? This is uh, this is our eyes that we were really relying on. And not okay, on so things. it is like the whole uh, the nanoparticle is agglomerated. The change of color is being detected, Correct. not a single particle, yes. and is binding with this no. virus is no. not the concern over here. Great, no. yeah, I no. got got the point. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. So, uh, any more questions uh, for Professor Pan? Uh, yeah, uh, Professor uh, Tanmay Datta. Uh, so he is uh, my colleague here at uh, Department of Chemistry at IIT Delhi. Yeah, Professor Tanmay. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes, uh, Dr. Pawn, it was really inspiring and timely work. Uh, interesting. Sure, thank you. Talk. Yeah. So I, I'm just a little curious about. Uh, the design of your uh, 
uh, oligo that you decided. It's very interesting that you decided to choose a protein which does not, uh, you know, frequently be, uh, get mutated. But with your detection, do you believe that it can differentiate between different variant of viruses, or uh, did you check that different variants of viruses uh, can be differentiated by the signaling or whatever bending is happening? Uh, yeah. That, so, uh, that, if, yeah. If you if you recall the slide that we uh, in one of the slides we actually showed that um, the design of the the, the oligos is such that that it is targeting um, the segment of engine that 421 from 440, right? And all the mutations and the the variants that are known, the mutations that are affecting the engine. Is not really in that range. So it's I think six sixty to six seventy, and then one is from seven twenty one to seven thirty three, and eleven thirty one to eleven thirty three. So those. So we know that this is not going to be affected by. And we we do have a few variants that we have tested, and we have seen that there is no change, um, because uh, you know scientifically there is no change, right? And um, also, we're not really targeting the S protein. So, the S protein is the most commonly, um, you know, uh, the protein that undergoes the mutation. So, we are, we deliberately, we are, we are keeping away from S protein. I mean, there are ways to target S protein, but um, we're not really even going there. So, we, we, we know that this is not going to affect. Now, I cannot guarantee that, um, and, and, and remember, these are all single point mutations, right? So, the single point mutations are, um, because of their single point mutations that, and because of our oligos kind of uh, is the claw approach that we discussed, um, the, that, that even if there is a single point mutation happening in, in, in these areas, it's unlikely that our, our oligos will not, uh, not, not be able to bind. Now, if you're saying that the, there is not a single point mutation, but eventually the virus undergoes maybe two or three mutations, then we have to redesign our ASOs because at that point um, um, we really cannot um, uh, because this is too much. This is almost like we are getting to a point where we have a new new virus, right? So uh, we, we cannot really um, target those. That's that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's really really interesting and inspiring. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Tanmay. And uh, any more uh, questions? Uh, um, let me check here. Okay, so it seems okay. So uh, okay, so it seems there are uh, no more questions at this point of time. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so thank you, uh, Professor Pan, again uh, for uh, agreeing to uh, deliver this lecture. And sure. uh, uh, thanks again. And uh, I think when uh, the situation normalizes again, uh, definitely we would like to host you physically sometime here at IIT Delhi in our department. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So probably uh, during uh, one of your uh, visits to India, probably we can coordinate. And sure. uh, yeah, and then uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Narayanan Purur, who is our HOD. I think he uh, could not uh, make it today uh, to the meeting, uh, but he has been uh, really helpful. And also the previous HOD, Professor Anil Elias, uh, it's his brainchild actually, this uh, international webinar. And also Professor Ram Ramaswamy, and also uh, Professor Janaki Ram, Professor Bishwarup, uh, Professor Dibhijati. And also Professor Tarak uh, for helping uh, me today in uh, organizing this. And uh, uh, to everyone present here, I would like to uh, uh, wish you very good health and uh, please stay safe and uh, we will uh, see you soon uh, for the next talk, which is uh, scheduled uh, next month. And uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Pan. I think it's, it was a pleasure uh, listening to you uh, personally too. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, meet again uh, very soon. Thank you, Samik. Uh, it's it's my pleasure, and thank you all for attending. Uh, pleasure meeting you all. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, Professor. Thank you.